Thank you for this opportunity uh, to share uh, updates on fluorescent image guided surgery, uh, specifically in colorectal uh, surgery part. And we have uh, many other speakers who will be covering different parts of um, uh, surgical subspecialties, but I do want to throw out to you and remind you that we do have fluorescence imaging station at Learning Center in the exhibit hall. Uh, at the Learning Center, you can watch a lot of different video clips uh, of different uh, topics using fluorescence image guided surgery. So if you have a time, please stop by uh, at the uh, Learning Station. I have uh, no, nothing to disclose. So uh, first of all, I, I do believe that every year at SAGES, we've been talking about uh, uh, near-infrared fluorescence imaging guided study, and we've done a lot of discussions. So I, th I do think that uh, people are familiar with the concept, and uh, it's, it's been widely accepted in uh, operating room as well as other clinical settings. So near-infrared, um, has uh, near infrared imaging has advantage because at its wavelength of between 700 to 900 nanometer, it penetrates deeper uh, in the tissue compared to white visible light. So when it's combined with a fluorophore such as ICG or methylene blue dyes, which are two dyes that's currently approved by FDA, it can help you detect tumor types, uh, detection of lymph node as well as lymphatic mapping, uh, structure identification and tissue perfusion. So I'll start with the tissue perfusion in colorectal surgery. Um, I say use it, it says use it routinely, but I use it routinely uh, in all my colorectal cases, uh, maybe straightforward right hemicolectomy or low uh, rectal cancer with the coloanal anastomosis. Um, technology is available in all modalities. Um, again, I have no disclosures, but um, the, some of the uh, uh, equipments that we use for open at our facility is SpyFi, which is a handheld near infrared camera. Um, it actually has now upgraded chip to SpyQP, which actually can quantify the intensity of your fluorescence. Uh, from laparoscopic modality, you can have a 1688 AIM uh, 4K striker model, as well as uh, Stortz has a Rubina 4K that actually help you perform fluorescence and geography uh, when needed. With the robotic platform, I'm familiar with the DaVinci uh, using Firefly, which literally is a flip up switch when you're sitting, sitting at the robotic console. So because ICG really has low toxicity profile, minimal side effect, uh, I use it routinely because it doesn't really cause any harm to the patient. If anything, I can gain more information. And it really adds minimal OR time uh, if you already have all these equipments at, at your facility and you have a team that's familiar with how to set this up. You can use uh, the ICG fluorescent angiography prior to anastomosis, after the anastomosis, essentially throughout the case at surgeon's discretion. So here, um, ICG fluorescent angiography is performed by mixing ICG dye, which comes in a powder form in a vial. You mix it with the 10 ml of uh, aqueous solvent. At our facility, we actually use 10 ml of sterile water. And uh, only contraindication for ICG at this time is because it has less than 5%, but it does have a sodium iodine. So if the patient has contrast uh, allergy or iodine allergy, then you have to be careful. And I wouldn't recommend using it because it can have anaphylactic reaction. Uh, in the literature, there's no standard dosing for uh, tissue perfusion assessment using uh, fluorescence and geography. Uh, minimal recommended dose is 2.5 milligram. I normally use uh, 5 milligram, which is when the dye is mixed, it's a 2 ml, and then you give 10 cc flush, and, let, uh, and you need to communicate with the anesthesiologist because they're the ones who actually give them intravenously. Uh, you can notice the visible vascular inflow within 60 seconds, and we're talking about arterial inflow. This study does not actually assess venous outflow or washout rate. Uh, uh, again, it can be given multiple times throughout the case at surgeon's discretion. So you need to let the anesthesiologist know that please do not throw away after you give 2 ml or 3 ml, whatever you ask for, because if they're not familiar with the fluorescence angiography, sometimes they'll just trash it once they give the dose that you ask for. 
So the reason we're talking about tissue perfusion is because when we do colorectal surgery, we want to minimize rate of anastomotic leak. In the literature, um, the rate of anastomotic leak for colorectal uh, anastomosis varies from 3 to 20 percent, depending on uh, different factors. But anastomotic leak def definitely increases morbidity, mortality, length of hospital stay, cost, as well as potentially cancer recurrence if the patient cannot uh, obtain adjuvant therapy that's needed due to prolonged hospitalization or debilitation because of the complication. So we want to minimize the anastomotic leak rate, but we know that tissue perfusion is not the only factor. It is multifactorial. Uh, some of them are surgeon related. And what I mean by that is some, is some of the things uh, as a surgeon we can control, meaning we can do air leak tests, we can evaluate anastomosis transanally via endoscopy, uh, technical aspects. We can ensure that patient has a good, uh, the segment of bowel has a good blood supply. However, obviously we cannot ignore patient related factors such as their underlying comorbidities, their uh, pathology requiring low, low anastomosis, history of um, neoadjuvant chemoradiation, um, uh, other factors. So what's, what is in the data regarding tissue perfusion by ICG fluorescent angiography? The first study I want to mention is Pillar 2 trial. Uh, which was uh, submitted in 2014. This study looked at uh, 139 eligible patients. Uh, this was non-randomized prospective multicenter trial using Novadec pinpoint ICG uh, uh, system. And in that study, uh, they noticed that 11%, uh, I'm sorry, 11 patients, which was 8% of their population had changed in surgical plan where they changed, majority of them had revision of their proximal margin. And their overall anastomotic leak rate in the study was 1.4%, which is significantly lower than what was uh, uh, noted in the literature. And because of uh, positive outcome where, and these 11 patients did not have any anastomotic leak. So this led uh, significant interest in, uh, among surgeons uh, regarding using um, fluorescent angiography for tissue perfusion. However, there are a lot of other studies, uh, including uh, systematic review as well as uh, uh, meta-analysis of papers. Um, I listed these two studies. Um, the first study uh, was a trial, and this study actually did note that there was a statistically significant uh, rate in anastomotic leak uh, reduction. And in this study, they looked at uh, an low anterior resection via both laparoscopic as well as open cases. But the most significant benefit was for those patients who, was, who were undergoing low uh, uh, rectal anastomosis, uh, about four to eight centimeter from anal verge. In that cohort of patients, the difference was significant. However, the paper below uh, was also a comparative uh, uh, trial, but in that study, even though 20% of their patients had change in surgical margin, but actual anastomotic leak rate, they did not see a significant uh, uh, statistically significant reduction, and that may be because of a small uh, uh, population of uh, uh, cohort. However, again, there are the studies out there, they all favor uh, ICG uh, fluorescence angiography with favorable odds ratio, but from statistically, uh, a statistical standpoint, uh, even though they have a lower anastomotic leak rate, there's no statistical uh, significance uh, in difference of anastomotic rate. So there is one uh, trial, ongoing trial that's occurring right now. It's a European trial, randomized multicenter trial, looking at rectal cancer patients undergoing uh, laparoscopic uh, rectal cancer surgery, either using uh, near infrared system versus regular white uh, light uh, laparoscopic system. And so hopefully when this study is done, uh, we can have more insight as to whether there's a statistical significance. Now, let's talk about structure identification in colorectal surgery. It's the ureter. And in this picture, yes, you're right, the ureter was transected in spite of having ICG uh, identifying the location of ureter. So 
overall, uh, there's less than 2% chance of you having iatrogenic ureteric injury during colorectal surgery. Um, ureter uh, ureteral injury increases, uh, is, ureteral injury is increased when, when you expect there's a lot of inflammatory changes in setting of diverticulitis or inflammatory bowel disease or malignancy, especially if you have a locally advanced cancer, as well as prior abdominal surgeries distorting anatomy, as well as radiation. However, in the literature, there's no consensus regarding prophylactic stent. Uh, even though prophylactic stent may help you identify the ureter, but the benefit of it is controversial. So the uh, American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, uh, their guideline for surgery when performing for diverticulitis, uh, their statement is that ureteral stents are used at discretion of the surgeon. So let's look at the, uh, how you actually do ureteral identification for uh, ICG. Um, so first of all, I don't use it on all my cases, partially because you have to coordinate this with a urologist. It's a cystoscopy guided ureteral catheter insertion. The tip can be at the ureteral uh, orifice or the stent can be placed all the way into renal pelvis. There's no standard dose how much to give uh, at the time of um, ICG injection. Some people may give half dose uh, on one ureter, the other half half a vial on uh, the other side. Uh, whereas you may give entire vial in uh, 25 milligram in the unilateral ureter. Where, whether to use bilateral or unilateral, that is also up to surgeon's discretion. Now, some people prefer methylene blue for ureter identification, partially because methylene blue is cleared completely uh, renally and you do not have to use uh, injection. You can, uh, via uh, ureteral stenting. You can actually give methylene blue intravenously at the dose stated, and you should be able to see um, the ureter lighting up from maybe 10 minutes after injection up to 20, uh, two hours post-injection. So there is actually no data regarding using ICG or methylene blue actually reduces your risk of ureteral injury. Yes, it does help identification, but whether it actually help you reduce the rate of injury, there's no available data. So I, uh, I'm listing the data from stent to stent or not to stent. So there's prophylactic ureteral stent placement where uh, these stents help you identify ureter. Does that actually reduce uh, your uh, rate of ureteral injury. Uh, both of these are systemic, uh, system, systematic review, and both of these studies, and there are other studies as well, uh, they state that placing prophylactic ureteral stent is not associated with decreased rate of ureteral injury. Uh, but at the same time, it is not associated with increased risk of uh, ureteral complications, such as AKI, UTI, sepsis, increased length of uh, hospital stay. Uh, however, most studies does mention that placing a prophylactic ureteral stent does increase your OR time significantly. Again, partially because uh, sometimes positioning the patient can be an additional factor as well as coordinating, uh, coordination with the urology. Uh, lymphatic mapping in colorectal surgery is an area that's still being investigated. Um, I list these two studies, but the idea is that you know, when we do lymphadenectomy for colorectal surgery, colon surgery, we do same lymphadenectomy, whether it's a T0, T1, early colon cancer, versus whether you have a locally advanced clinical, clinical T3 uh, colon cancer. So is there any way we can do lymphatic mapping and detect uh, lymph nodes uh, related to colon cancer? and individualized lymphatic mapping so that these early colon cancer patients do not get these radical lymphadenectomy, whereas patients with locally advanced cancer, maybe they should receive D3 lymphadenectomy down to base of SMB, SMA. Now, uh, again, it is an area of investigation. Um, there is no standard standardization as to how to inject the dye. Some studies, they inject intraoperatively, subsorsally. Some, places, some studies suggest that you inject uh, peritumoral via colonoscopy. The timing of it, uh, intra-op versus day before, actual dose as to how to place uh, the ICG dye, it's all under investigation.
So in conclusion, ICG fluorescent angiography is helpful in determining adequate tissue perfusion and likely lowering the rate of anastomotic leak, even though we don't have a strong study suggesting statistically significant difference. ICG dye and methylene blue dye can be used to identify ureters intraoperatively, especially useful during minimally invasive surgeries where tactile feedback is lacking. During open surgery, you can actually feel for the stent, whereas uh, in minimally invasive surgery, these visual cues uh, under near-infrared fluorescence imaging can come in very, help, uh, very handy. ICG dye has been used for lymphatic mapping and lymph node de detection in various types of cancers, including colorectal cancer. However, much work needs to be done. The near infrared technology is improving, and more agents are actually being studied to improve patient outcome and patient care and clinical outcomes. Thank you.